The following interview was conducted with Richard D. Freeman, uh, Bachelor of Science 1950 on uh, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, November 14, 2008 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian, and it's by phone. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Oh, fine. Gosh, thanks. Um, it's, it's neat to be talking to you, Katie, and I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to, to think back over the last 80 years and, and, <laughs> and the then some relationship that I've had with Purdue. It's just been wonderful. I was, uh, was born in southern Indiana, a little town called Rushville, and that's where my mom was from. And immediately after my birth, my grandfather delivered me. Uh, immediately after my birth, we, uh, I was moved back to the home in West Lafayette, Indiana, on Marsteller Street, uh, right across from what at that time were some of the most beautiful uh, horticultural gardens that were in the state of Indiana. And uh, so that's, that's where my home was. And, and then for the first six years, we lived right across the street. Uh, Where'd you go to grade school? I went to Morton. Okay. Um, which is close to the uh, West Lafayette Library. And I think it's now sort of a... Uh, Community center. Yeah, center, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I was in there a few years back. Sure. What yeah. about uh, high school? Tell us a little bit about what your activities... Oh, and high and school uh, was uh, started in what was then the uh, uh, called the junior high school, and it was not far from where Delta Tau Delta is, the fraternity at the corner of Northwestern and Grant Street. And there was a school that, that was in there. And uh, it had been the, the high school uh, until the new West Lafayette High School was built up uh, on a uh, stadium. So I started in that little high school, which was then called junior high, and then we finished a couple of years there and then moved on to the new, what was then the the new wonderful school called West Lafayette Senior High. Okay. Yeah. What, what about activities? Tell us about high school. What, so oh, high school was a wonderful time for me, and I, I, I remember crying at the, and enjoyed the, the work so much, but, but crying when I didn't get an A+. Plus. <laughs> oops, oops. <laughs> Need a little consoling there, right? Yeah, a little consoling. And, you know, when I'd get an A, I thought that was just horrible. If you didn't have an A+, plus, it was... It was top of my, and, and my dad gave me, a, I think I got a quarter or a dime or something for every A+. Plus. So at that time, you know, it was kind of a big deal. Sure. It helped, it helped with the budgeting. <laughs> yeah, and I was active in the track team and, and on the football team and, um, and in the activities of the high school uh, newsletter that we put out okay. and high Y and things like that. Wonderful, wonderful time. Good. Lots and lots of wonderful people in that school, and I am still in touch with many of them today by email. Good. Well, your, well was your father affiliated with the university? Yes, all of his entire life. Okay. Tell us. Uh, he first arrived at Purdue on horseback <laughs> from from the farm, which is in was at that time in Fayette County, and uh, was about a two day ride. I think he spent two days getting there by horse, and and. Um, barracked his horse when he when he arrived in a field which is right across from the Pi Beta Phi house on State Street. And <laughs> I always think about that meadow that was in there and that was where he parked his horse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a, it was a, so he, uh, he arrived at the school in, uh, as I recall, 1918, I believe, right near the end of World War I and then graduated in 1923 and almost immediately went to work for Purdue. Okay. And he worked for Dean Skinner and was what I think at that time they called assistant dean. And um, he and Skinner uh, started to develop the program for uh, Purdue Agriculture. Okay, okay good. Um, now let's move, uh, tell us a little bit about college and you understand you went to Purdue. Oh, uh, did you have any other choices? <laughs> well, you know, at the time, right, it was right at the end of World War II. And About I wanted 45 to get, or so. Yeah, it was 1945, and I wanted to get into the service. So I joined the service, and then I found 
out that the Navy was at a program um, <clears throat> at that time was called V-12. And the V-12 program sent their people to various universities. So by joining the Navy in the V-12 program, I was able to select Purdue as a school to go to. And that program, V-12, later became what was called the Holloway Plan. And several of us that enrolled in the V-12 became Holloway uh, participants. And eventually, uh, about two years before I graduated, the Holloway Plan turned into what is now the NROTC, which I think is still active in the Purdue campus. Correct. Yep. Okay. And that was a, a very, very good program, which got our books and tuition and that sort of thing and took us on even better things like uh, uh, trips during the summer months to uh, got a chance to travel all over the world. <laughs> As I said, join the Navy and see the world. <laughs> it held true in your life, huh? Okay. Absolutely. I've just had a delightful time traveling in the world. Tell us a bit about campus life and in your oh, other sure. involvement. And, yeah. and did you, where did you live when you were? Did you live at home or? Uh, well, most of the time, uh, Katie, I lived at home. Um, the last year or two, I moved into the fraternity uh, to get more of a feeling of what was going on there. And because of the fact that I'd been elected an officer in the uh, fraternity, and so I lived at uh, the Kappa Sig House, which is right next to the uh, Westlife Ed Fire Station now. And um, that was a wonderful period. And during that same time, I was active on the Purdue Debris and became an, one of the editors of the Debris and had a couple of different uh, assignments with, with the Debris. And um, also was very active in, in student government. And it was during the uh, student government phase that uh, I got very interested in, in uh, well, I was really interested in what was going to happen to people like my dad and all the people that I knew that were in the university, and what what happened to them at the time when they when they retired, because some of these mines were so wonderful and so active, it seemed a shame to uh, to waste that talent. And from that idea, my interest in that uh, came the old masters plan. In fact, my title for it was old masters. And um, that was developed uh, by, the, uh, by our executive group of the student council at that time. And that program, I think, is still operating. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, we just had it about a week ago. Oh, <laughs> and I think it's been just really wonderful, not only for the uh, folks that come back and get a chance to be with students and find out what's going on with them, but also for the students who get a taste of what uh, what it's like out in the business world. Right, exactly. Good point. What was your major? Any professors that uh, you'd like to uh, did you had in oh, class? Oh, yeah, Paul Stanley, I, who is no longer with us, of course, and uh, he was in the Aero School. That was your major in aeronautics? Yeah, okay. Uh, aeronautics. And uh, Paul Stanley is one of the guys that I remember with, with who was one of the wonderful uh, men of aviation at the time. K.D. Wood was just on his way out when I got there, and, and it's interesting, K.D. Wood, um, who wrote one of the early books on aeronautics, um, had a son by the name of Bob, and Bob and I have become best friends here in California. Mm, okay. In fact, I was with him last night. Okay, good. Small world. Yeah, really. Get smaller small all world. the time. And I want to mention also a couple of other guys, but one of the main guys I want to remember is a man by the name of uh, Mark Fowler, and uh, he was very dynamic in his work with uh, students and helping them understand that there was a big world past school. Um, how about any other student organizations? You, you were the debris, but when, were you out with the exponent at all? Or No, I didn't. Okay. I was not a part of the exponent. In fact, mm -hmm. we kind of like to rub antenna with the exponent guys and, in the debris, and show them how things really ought to be done. <laughs> One publication to another, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was uh, on the Engineering Council um, and um, was in the Gimlet Club and uh, just I, w I was very, very interested in what was going on at, uh, in the uh, all kinds of student organizations. But 
but primarily student government, I think, was the thing that interested me the most. Okay, good. Uh, you had some special feats. Let's talk about the, what, the heat tunnels or the familiarity oh. with the buildings? <laughs> well, you know, as, as, as I was growing up, I, because of my dad, the, a lot of the people from the university would be at our house. Um, and, and through various uh, church um, associations, um, I got to meet uh, people, and uh, one of them was a guy by the name of Cap Kemmer. And Cap ran up. Uh, Dick, a let me say, there's, Dick, there's a little background noise in there. Is that the TV? There's a background noise that's coming from a couple of people who are working in the house. Oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. Go ahead. But Cap Kemmer ran a thing called Kemmer Construction, and oh. Kemmer built many of the buildings at Purdue. Correct. And and because of the association I had with, through my father, not me, but Cap was very good to me. And when I needed summer jobs, I always worked for Kemmer Construction. And during those construction times in the summer, one of the uh, jobs that I worked on with the Kemmer folks uh, were heat tunnels. Um, which run all over the universities today. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and it really is kind of clever. You don't really think much about it, but the top of the heat tunnels are the sidewalks. And you've probably wondered why the sidewalks are always seem to be shoveled during snowstorms. Correct. And it is because of the heat in the tunnel that, that keeps the uh, snow off the, uh, off the sidewalks. Oh, very kind, of a, kind of a clever way mm -hmm. of up shoveling snow. Sure, it's a unique piece of history that I was not aware of. Very good. And through those tunnels, you can get, you can move around the university without ever getting rained on. You can move from one building to the next. These tunnels are like a spider web around the campus, mm -hmm. and and anytime you want to move from one building to another, there's a a lit tunnel. That, well, there are lights down there. You can turn on it and walk all over the campus. I got very familiar with moving around the campus through those tunnels. <laughs> You're an expert in underground, well, I right? I used to be. I yeah. used to be. <laughs> you were talking, you mentioned about that machine gun range during oh, World War II, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, that was kind of neat. I worked for uh, George Hawkins. At yeah, that you had mentioned that, too. Uh -huh. And, and what, a, what a neat man he was. Gosh, I loved, I loved him. Uh, but the uh, university had a uh, contract with the uh, U.S. Army Ordnance and uh, to test 50 caliber machine guns was the initial contract. And the idea was to, uh, the reason for the testing was to test various ideas for speeding up the rate of fire or the, what they call the cyclic fire for the, uh, for the machine guns. And Purdue did a lot of that work of speeding up the machine gun. Most machine guns operate, the, the larger ones, the 50 caliber operated around 500 rounds a minute. And we were able to, Purdue was able to, in the, in the work that they did, to get these cyclic rates up over a thousand rounds per minute. And why is that important? Well, when an aircraft has these guns in the wings, um, they're only on target for very, just very minute amounts of time. So it's important that the gun is operating very rapidly, or it was at that time. And of course, it was a big thing to me, uh, not being able to, at that time, to be in the war, but to uh, be associated with what was going on in the, in the sure. war. And the, uh, the range, by the way, was right across from the executive building, um, behind what is now the mechanical engineering building. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> You, you talk about noise when the, the gun was fired. A 50 caliber gun could be heard not just around West Lafayette, but it could be easily heard in, in all over parts of Lafayette. So you can imagine the noise that would have been in the mechanical engineering building, not to, and not to mention the executive building or any of the other all campus. Right. What's today known as a sonic boom? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and we fire for, for maybe a minute at a, at a time, and that's a lot of noise. Sure is, right. Yeah. And what happened, Katie, was instead, of, we finally the noise, I think, got too much, and uh, we built uh, some three ranges uh, out in what is now the parking lot for the uh, um, um, ross Aid Stadium. And those ranges were sat right where the... Uh, the, the racetrack is. You know where, where that Grand, is out Grand Prix? 
the Grand Prix yeah, where track? the Grand Prix track is. Okay. And so our ranges were right there, and we had a 50 caliber range, um, we had a 37 millimeter range, and then we had a smaller range for testing pistols and carbines. And it was just a great time, and working for a guy like George Hawkins was uh, <laughs> nothing better. Just wonderful. I remember one time uh, I was moving a battery. It was a, a battery, like a car battery, and and not realizing it, I dropped the battery from maybe two or three inches above the floor, and the acid squirted out of a little hole in the top of the battery and hit me in the eye. And George Hawkins saw that happen, and before I knew it, he had me and my whole head under the under a spigot and was flushing my eye out and probably saved my eyesight. And uh, after he got all got the initial washing done, he uh, put me in his car and sped me down to Doc Miller. Have you ever heard any stories about Doc Miller? No. <laughs> was he the physician on he was, campus? He, he was the original socialist medicine guy. <laughs> Oops. And and was <laughs> and was the Purdue doctor for years and years, and he worked for the you know the, not only the football and basketball teams, but he took care of the students and was had quite a reputation. It was, it was a very good one, by the way. And uh, Doc Miller was uh, the answer to any anything that went wrong. You went to Doc Miller, and his offices at that time were in the administration building. I guess it's what Hubby Hall now. Mm, that's correct. It yeah. used to be the executive office building. Yeah, it was called the executive offices. Uh -huh. And I was in that when, as they were building it, riding my bicycle around in there. <laughs> <laughs> Just loved it because it has an elevator in it, as you remember. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I'd ride that elevator with my bicycle up to the various floors so I could pedal around in the <laughs> fourth <laughs> floor. You had your own playground. Yeah, had my own playground all <laughs> over that place. There you go. <laughs> Loved it. Yeah. Not to mention the heat tunnels that I could ride through. <laughs> oh. Let's talk. Um, after you graduated then in, the in 1950, would you have to you had to continue in the service? Yes, I continued in the service. So okay. At, in the NROTC, you have an opportunity in the middle of your uh, junior year <clears throat> to stay in the Navy or select uh, the Marine Corps. And... Um, I decided that uh, I wanted to be a Marine, so in the middle of my junior year, I, I joined the Marine chunk. There were six of us, that, the very first of the six graduates of Purdue in the, in the Marine Corps as, uh, as officers. And so at graduation, we reported, all six of us reported to Quantico, Virginia, and uh, began our training there. And uh, as we were there in the first few months, uh, the Korean War broke out, and immediately after our graduation, half of our class went to uh, to Korea. And uh, I went to a, uh, a school at Fort Bliss, Texas, an Army school, where I was trained in um, um, anti-aircraft and guided missile work, which was my first introduction to, uh, to missiles, uh, which was to become my avocation. And so following the service, following that training, I went to Korea and spent a wonderful year in what at that time was a very impoverished uh, country, totally unlike it is today. Mm -hmm. Were you in combat at all or was the Oh, yes. Weather? Oh, okay. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, you, were oh, doing, yeah. you were there I for the, for the like activities. Getting, yeah, I didn't like getting shot at. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. Okay. <laughs> then, so after that, I, yeah. I, after that tour in Korea, uh, my, my service was, uh, obligations were finished. I remained in the reserve, but I came back to Purdue. And through uh, Dean Young, um, got an opportunity to uh, get into graduate school and uh, did so in the Department of Economics. And the, uh, the man that was my leader during that time was a fellow by the name of uh, Vern Owen, O-W-E-N, Vern Owen, and everybody called him Doc, with good reason. And Doc was the guy who guided me through the initial um, uh, the studies that we were doing, and at that time, labor economics. But during that period, um, he kept trying new classes on me, and uh, along with Dr. Estes at that time, 
and um, uh, one or two others, um, they began to develop a course which turned into what is now today's Cranert School. And so I became, the, interestingly enough, one of the first graduates of Cranert School in 1954, actually before a Cranert School existed. Mm -hmm. But the uh, classwork and the work that I did and the reports that I gave back after getting into industry uh, helped to uh, put a curriculum together, which, as I say, became a Cranert Graduate School. All right. Okay. All righty. After you finished that, then, you know, what was your career path? Is that when you'd like to share some... And yeah, yeah, right at the end of that time, yeah. uh, uh, after graduation from the uh, 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 master's program, um, I joined General Motors and uh, in the industrial engineering department and uh, had a grand boss uh, and a wonderful introduction to a company which at that time was one of the finest companies in America. And I was very proud to be a part of of what GM was doing. They were uh, facilitating uh, not just uh, automobiles, but also air conditioning, uh, uh, refrigeration, um, all kind of uh, uh, small fractional horsepower motors, um, any number of things that, uh, that went to our society um, in addition to automobiles. And of course, did a very good job with the five car divisions and putting cars and trucks on the road. Mm -hmm. It was a good, good company. Mm -hmm. And I had many good associations. The uh, One of the men that I hired at General Motors while I was there, a young man by the name of uh, Richard LaFoe, uh, who we called Skip, um, grew in General Motors and became one of the vice presidents of GM, and then later was tasked by the board of directors to put a a new small car together, and that was the Saturn, which is currently uh, in use throughout the world. Mm, that's right. And Skip did a great job of putting that company together down in Springfield. All right, good. What about uh, then? You had when then when you worked, start working for some aircraft companies. Well, so yeah. Can, after I'd had about five had, years of sure. GM and doing that kind of thing, and, and I think I had a quite a good future with GM, but I was anxious to work in my uh, career what I'd chosen as my career and my career interest. And at, at, and at that time, I got a call from a little company in the electronics business called Ramo Woldridge. There were two guys, Simon Ramo and Dean Woldridge, both of whom had worked for Howard Hughes. And um, they were the guys that actually put together the first air-to-air -air, uh, guided missiles. <clears throat> And, uh, and we're a little disappointed in the way Hughes managed things. And of course, <laughs> I found out later working for Hughes Aircraft later on that that Hughes rarely managed anything. He uh, he was usually off counting his money. It was very hard to get to. And <laughs> at any rate, uh, both Woldridge and Cy Rabo decided to start their own company. And with the help of a guy by the name of General George, who had just then left the Air Force, and uh, Thompson Products, a company in Cleveland that had been very instrumental in the uh, uh, automotive business, formed a company that was called, at the time, Ramo Woldridge. And um, shortly after I joined Ramo Woldridge, um, Thompson, who, that had been the people who had put the money up for this venture, decided to get their name in the act. They decided this little company was going to succeed. So the name of the company was changed to what it is today, PRW, and it's one of our finest defense uh, industry um, businesses in, in, in the world. And um, having a chance to work for Cy Ramo in those early years was just a very pleasant thing. So from the time of, of, of Ramo Woldridge, then later I was attracted to a uh, company at Curtis Wright, which was uh, starting a business in Albuquerque, and they asked me to come in and, and become the uh, plant manager. And from there, I went on to work for Hughes Aircraft in the late 60s. And Hughes Aircraft is, without question, the finest company that I've ever had a chance to work for. There were, um, 
I think we spilled more technology than most companies ever have. And and Hughes, while he wasn't our our boss, um, certainly was a very big name draw and was made it possible for us to get in maybe places that we might not have gotten into before. <clears throat> but it was uh, while I was at Hughes Aircraft that I got into uh, uh, missile design. And uh, most of my work, Katie, was conceptual. Um, that is, I see a problem while it being in the Pentagon with the people there and, and realize that if, if I took several technologies that we had at Hughes and put them together, together in different ways, uh, we'd have a solution to, to that problem. Um, one such program um, was the Maverick missile, which is an air-to-ground missile, the AGM-65. And I was the author of that, of that missile. And it's still in uh, use today. It's being used in uh, Iraq, and it's been very successful in uh, in the uh, in all the time it's been used in the last, oh, gosh, 35 years. Pretty good. Yep. <laughs> very good. Had lots of fun doing that. Sounds like it. And that led me into other missile design. Um, um, we, I, I, and others uh, did uh, conceptual work for the. Uh, what was then called the YF-12A, and that was Kelly Johnson's the aircraft we know today as the Blackbird or the SR-71. And we designed the missile system that was on the YF-12, and that aircraft was to be the uh, replacement for the F-106, the Delta Dart, and, and it was to be used as an air defense weapon um, and we had four missiles on board that we launched at speeds of over Mach 3, and the missiles then had speeds of, of up to Mach 7 after it left the aircraft. So it had some very, very interesting challenges with regard to heat and vibration. Um. Working with Kelly Johnson, um, who was at Lockheed at the time, um, was a was quite an experience, and Kelly was one of the real conceptual guys of of the of that era, and and I think will go down as one of the finest designers of uh, of aircraft in uh, ever, okay. along with guys like Douglas okay. and uh, Jack Northrop and and others that I've known in this in the business. Right. It's a wonderful opportunity that I had to uh, to meet and work with guys like. Uh, Packard, Dave Packard, and, and and Hewlett, and others that started companies like Hewlett Packard and right. Litton Industries, and watched all this stuff grow at the time. It was what an opportunity! Marvelous, just yeah. marvelous. Yeah. And then you uh, were, were Rock were, but now you have your own company. Is that correct? Well, after oh. I, I was I was at, while I was at Hughes, um, I I got to be uh, known for the work that I was doing with these various missiles. And having developed several of these missiles, among them the Maverick, um, gave me an opportunity to get kind of uh, some exposure to to other companies. And I got a, an opportunity to work for a man by the name of Jim Ling. And uh, uh, he had formed a company called Ling Tempco Vought, um, which today we know as LTV. And Jim was a very, very clever guy as a uh, as a manager, and I wanted to find out some of the techniques that he was using. So uh, I took the opportunity to become a vice president of that company, and uh, that got me into uh, oh things in the reconnaissance area and, uh, and data and intelligence gathering uh, fields. And um, it, it wasn't missiles anymore, but it was something very similar to that, uh, but more. We were doing a lot of things like that, but mo mostly in the intelligence area and various um, um, databases that were developed for uh, uh, countries like Israel and, and Iran. And, and later on, we even did a lot of work for uh, various government agencies like uh, NSA and CIA. Mm -hmm. Good. And that was all at LTV, and we were at that time located in Dallas. And, um, and working away at that thing, I got a call from 
uh, North American and, um, and an opportunity to move back to the West Coast. And our family had loved the West Coast and didn't take us a lot of work to decide to, to make the switch and come back to uh, what became Rockwell International at that time. It was called North American and then North American Rockwell, and finally NAR, and then finally just Rockwell International. Mm -hmm. So I was a vice president of Rockwell, and in that capacity I worked primarily in intelligence gathering, mm -hmm. various systems related to intelligence gathering, a lot of satellite work. Mm -hmm. We also were building the uh, guidance system for the uh, Minuteman missile and for also for the Polaris submarine and the Polaris missile. Good. And following, following that, Katie, I decided I'd go out and try it on my own. So and that's what I've been doing for the last 30 years or more. Yeah. Um, Building upon the, the, the bricks and things you had before. Yes, yes. And just, oh gosh, it just, it, every day I get up and I can't wait to right. do something else. It just, I'm working on a thing right now, Katie, you'd get a kick out of it. It's called semantics. You ever heard the word semantics? Mm, yes. Yeah, you've heard it. Mm -hmm. it, it, what it. What it is is the... Um, a machine design for a computer that thinks. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've formed a small company called no Knowledge Foundations, and it's primarily a, uh, uh, a, it's programming that allows our current machines to, uh, to be able to interact with various databases and gather an answer to a question as opposed to just gathering data from a a particular database, and I think this is one of the big waves of the future. I see this as a, one of the very coming technologies, sure. currently being referred to, originally referred to as artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which is how I got first got into it, but now we call it semantics. Okay, good. Uh, you were doing a little, you've done some teaching too, Dick. Uh, oh, yeah. Tell, yeah. tell us about, uh, what, are you still doing that? or? Uh, no, okay. no, I did that for, uh, oh, about, I guess around four years. Uh -huh. And uh, it was something that I guess it, it's kind of a heritage, I suppose. Uh, my grandmother was a teacher. My both my grandmothers were teachers, and then my dad was a teacher, and uh, and my mother was a teacher. And so I decided that it would be fun to uh, to uh, to try that myself. And so I was I had an opportunity to go to work for a. a uh, what's called today West Coast University. I didn't. And, uh, that name didn't ring a bell. Yeah, it's it very, is. very active. And, okay. Uh, um, particularly here on the West Coast, and it has put a program together for people that work during the day and want to uh, go to the university at night. Mm, okay. So it's so it's a night school. Good. Okay. It's really, what it is, and gosh, the the people that come in are so interested in learning they, they they know what it's like to work but they want something better sure they're so the highly minds, motivated the minds are just really they, they just cry out for more information and, and more learning yes Good. motivation is wonderful right Never have any trouble with attendance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's a good sign. And they always want more. They, they drain me dry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now your special interest, uh, Amelia Earhart. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Tell us what, uh, yeah. knowing that uh, the collections well, you know, are this here. All, that all started at Purdue, too, because uh, Amelia um, came to Purdue University in, well, in, 1935. in, in the middle 30s. Yeah, 35. And, and I met her in 36. Uh, my dad took me over. He, he knew how interested I was in aviation at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was just a young punk, and uh, but he was trying his best to, to, not knowing much about aviation himself, but was trying to feed me things that he knew were of interest to me. And so um, took me over to one of the uh, things that she put on for the university um, in the armory. And um, I, I don't recall that there were a lot of people there uh, on the order of maybe, oh, 30, 40, maybe as many as 50. But it, I don't, as I recall, we weren't even sitting down. There weren't even any chairs. And she was uh, standing on a, uh, on a wooden platform, which was, couldn't have been more than six inches off the floor, but at the time seemed like a kind of a neat thing, a dais to talk from. And she was uh, telling the the um, 
uh, professors that were there that had come to this meeting, and and of course uh, people like me, uh, uh, what her plans were for her next flight, her round the world flight, and uh, she had brought her Electra to the campus, uh, the twin engine uh, Lockheed aircraft that she was using uh, was going to use in her uh, round the world trip, and so I had a chance to meet her and and he. She wanted to know about my interest, and I said it was in, in, in aviation. And she said, "Please, please continue. Don't don't ever give up your um, interest in that field." She says it's something that'll that'll be with us for years and years. And I just really nice encouragement from her. Good, very good. Yeah. So later on, uh, after I got uh, loose from Rockwell International. Um, and was in my own company, I decided to start and see if I couldn't um, solve the mystery of her disappearance. And I've spent 25, maybe somewhere between 25 and 30 years um, looking at that problem and, and discovering, I think, what happened to her. So I think we've got, uh, we're, we're, we have a solution. To, uh, to to that mystery, one that satisfies me and one that fits the facts that I've been able to find. Okay. But that took me into the Pacific, and um, I spent many, many, many trips uh, in and around the Marshall Islands and the Mariana Islands, which was an area that she had flown over. And uh, no question in my mind that she landed in the uh, in the Marshall Islands um, and after having been um, shot at and undoubtedly shot down by the Japanese so the story goes on from there and I won't <laughs> go okay. into that okay. detail but right. it's a very interesting story All right okay um, let's move on to the alumni participation here sure. of course the class of 1950 the hall that's here, and oh, yeah, uh, yeah. you've been you've been active in the alumni association. Oh, very, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Another enjoyable part of my life has been uh, with the Purdue alumni guys, and uh, and and in particular with the libraries. And that's. Uh, yes, I was going to ask because you were one of the inaugural the deans, um, Dean Mobley's, I believe, the inaugural yeah. of development advisory committee. Had yeah, this. Uh, I think an excellent idea of attracting people from industry who had a desire to work in and 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 do some guidance with uh, with the libraries in terms of uh, the kind of material that the library might amass, um, not only in special collections, which I think Purdue has done a just a beautiful job with, but but also in the kinds of uh, pressures that the library will feel as the future comes along in terms of uh, storage, for instance, of, of data. And uh, there are so many different storage systems that it creates quite a problem of gee, do, how many machines do you have to keep around to, uh, to get the data out of such things as, as wire recorders or punch paper tape or magnetic tape. Uh, a lot of data stored on various media that are uh, you know, a few years from now, we won't have anything capable of reading it. Right. And uh, and one of these aspects is what we've already discussed for a few minutes, and that's the idea of semantics and how do you store data in bases and then get at it, get out the kind of things you're uh, you're looking for and need and need. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I think Purdue has done some really interesting things in that regard, and. And a lot of it started with this uh, committee that Emily Mobley started. Right, yeah, good one. Were you, have you been involved with the President's Council? Yes, okay. of course, yes, I okay. have. Okay, uh -huh. so when you come back, you see you participate, and of course, oh, yeah. and you remember, yeah. you did one of those back-to-campus classes one year. Yes, and, I, yeah. I did that uh, for the library. I That's think right. One of the first times the first library times was involved. I, correct, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we uh, had a, Guys, we had a huge crowd. There. I know. I were remember. you there, Katie? Yep, I, I was there. there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was there. Right. A <laughs> um, <laughs> couple of things on um, some of the, the awards and honors you've gotten. You've gotten quite a few. Want to make a comment? One of the ones is that um, the DEA that you got 
distinguished oh, yes. engineering alumnus, yeah. and also yeah. your outstanding aerospace engineer award oh, from yeah. your school. Yes, yeah, that my relationship with uh, with Dr. Ferris, Tom Ferris, and the Aero School has just been excellent. And uh, I noticed on my computer today, I got another invitation to uh, to join Tom and the school. They're going to be out here at Long Beach. Oh, good. Um, I think it's next month. Uh-huh. But uh, I'll be at, I'll have a chance to uh, to to get with those guys when they're out here. And I always try and meet Tom whenever he's out this way. Sure. And the president's council does regional things too, as well yeah, as the school do. does. Yeah, yeah. And that makes it easier for the people to get together. And we've got a lot of good. Uh, young folks who are uh, acting as uh, alumni relation guys for not just the Aero School, but I think for all the schools. But I have a chance to uh, usually meet with the Aero guys when they're out this way. Oh, well, good. Okay. And then you also got um, that your uh, the fraternity the lifetime achievement oh, yeah. award <laughs> from Kappa Sigma Fraternity, and you're inducted yes. in the Hall of Fame. Yes, that's very, true. Very I good. Would. <laughs> I noticed. It was a neat thing. I noticed on the professional associations that sort of one, that one that I have this when they're on your Vita, the American Institute of Industrial Engineers. Are you still involved with that? Yes, I am, but not not as much as I okay. was. Originally. You know, they were in Vancouver this year in May. Yes, I know that. I keep track of them, but um, m- most of that work that I did was at General Motors uh-huh. in the industrial area. But it's good to keep keep your hand in there. But it, but it's such a, a basic industry to to so many different. Uh, aspects of our life that it's a uh, my wife likes to say that I'm always trying to get her to make the bid more <laughs> expeditiously and, and she gets upset with when I tell her that she shouldn't be cooking in two different pans she could do it all in one <laughs> you know things like that yeah, little things right <laughs> uh, and you've also been involved with the, the Eagle Scout Association and yes, you're the president yes. and you still keep with, involved with that I, too I stay involved with the Boy Scouts or, and, and I did for many years particularly with my own sons who yeah. were a part of it and um, both of my sons became Eagle Scouts and are now involved in scouting. Oh, good. Well, tell us a about family. Where did you meet your wife, and what? Tell us well, about your children. I met my wife at Purdue. Okay. And she's uh, sitting not far from me right now. Hi there. Listening to all this. <laughs> she said, Hi, Rosemary. Hi, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was at Purdue, and she was very, very active in school. She was. Uh, what school did she get her degree? She, she uh, school of science. Oh, okay. And and she was also um, president of the Panhellenic. Very good. Uh, association. It has the great plant sale every year. <laughs> they sell those plants. Um, and uh, she was a very, very active in the Pi Beta Phi House. Uh huh. And um, and was one of their leaders for the years that she was in school. And we met at Purdue when we were both freshmen, and and um, have remained married now for. Um, well, we married at, in 1950 when we both graduated. And um, we just celebrated our 58th anniversary. Congratulations. Isn't that neat? Yeah, that's the best. Very good. She's the best thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> what about children? Where are they? Are any out Well, we have four, four children, uh-huh. two, two girls and two boys. The two girls are older. And uh, our oldest daughter I was with last night, uh, Deborah, and also with my other daughter, Phyllis. I had both of them, and, and my son, Tom, were with both Jane and I last night, we had a, uh, we put on a, um, a movie benefit to raise uh, money for the uh, Child Abuse Prevention Center, which is one of my favorite uh, charities. And we put on the, um, we, we showed a, a, a movie of uh, the new 007 movie that's mm-hmm. just out. And we got, we always get the, uh, a day before it's, it's premiere throughout the U.S., so it, it will be premiering tonight, but we had it last night and had a uh, 600, over 600 people in our theater to, uh, to see it and to uh, participate in this, this fundraiser. Oh, good. That's very nice. Mm. It was. It was just, it was, it's grand. We do that every year to raise money for the Child Abuse Prevention Center, right. which is a part of the National Exchange Club. Okay. And which you've been involved Club. in. And I've been very involved in that. Sure. Yes. And uh, it's headquartered in Toledo, Ohio, and uh, has chapters throughout the United States. Good. And uh, it's it's one of the service clubs, like uh, 
similar to uh, Kiwanis and Rotary, and mm -hmm. and it's a club like that. Okay. Um, are your did your children graduate from Purdue? Uh, no, oh. they the, all they were each from a, uh, went to a different school. Okay. Um, for instance, my oldest son, who is now an executive with uh, UPS. Uh, graduated from uh, Stephen F. Austin University, um, which is in Nacogdoches, Texas. Uh -huh. At the time, we were living in Texas. And uh, both my, my oldest son and my oldest daughter were uh, uh, students at, you know, at uh, Stephen F. Austin. Mm -hmm. My son, Tom, my youngest son, Tom, is now with IBM, and he graduated from the... Uh, San Diego State University. When, of course, we moved to California, there was a handier thing to for him to, to go to San Diego. Sure, to, sure. To Nacogdoches, Texas. There, there you go. Okay. <laughs> but all four of the kids are just doing great, and we've got nine grandchildren. <laughs> oh, good. Holidays are look coming up. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Chauncey. I had all but two of those guys with me last night. Oh. We had the entire <laughs> family together at the movie. Oh, good. Chauncey Village, uh, when you in the 50s, it's mm -hmm. a lot different than it is today, isn't oh, it? Oh, my, yes. Yeah. And even in the 30s, too. <laughs> all right. It's yeah. Gr it's yeah. grown a lot. How well I remember that. Oh, yeah. gosh, what fun times. In fact, there's a uh, there's an article in the Purdue Alumnus, I think the one that just came out. Oh, uh-huh about uh, Harry's Chocolate Shop. Did you have a chance to see that? I, I, uh, a friend of mine gets it and shares the magazine, but I haven't seen the current one. Yeah. I'll have to well, look at it. Story, and you, of course, know about Harry's. Oh, of course, yes. <laughs> Any uh, particularly gala week or homecoming, you, you line up or whatever. Oh, yeah. yeah. In well, fact, Harry's, for homecoming this year, they put ropes outside on the sidewalk and oh, make really? the line a little bit easier <laughs> to manage. <laughs> well, I knew Harry quite well because Harry was the father of one of the girls I dated in high school. Oh, okay. His last name was Merrick. Yes, I know and, that. Right. <laughs> I've heard that. Joan, <laughs> Joan, was his, Joan was his oldest kid, uh, Joan Merrick, Joanne Merrick. And then, of course, there was a, a, a younger brother of Joanne, and his name was, I believe, Harry Jr. Oh, okay. And we pledged him at Kappa Sig House, so we'd always have a corner seat. <laughs> <laughs> Always thinking ahead, right? Yeah, I'd tell Harry that. that he'd, you know, he'd throw another beer, beer bottle at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Do you have a um, favorite Purdue tradition that, that, come, that you'd yeah, like to share? The one I, yeah, I was thinking about that, and uh -huh. the thing that I like the best is Hello Walk. And I don't suppose they do much anymore with that. I, I guess, do people know that there still is? Well, sort of. And they put the plaques. I think the class of 53 did something, and they well, did, did some they renovation, not. and there's some plaques. But people, rec if you say that name, I think they'll understand it. They'll, yeah. they'll real, realize it. But I always got a kick out of one. <laughs> but they don't talk. They're just rushing to class. There's no, you know, helloing kind of thing. Yeah. I don't think yeah. so, which is okay. <laughs> Everybody's busy. How about an outstanding event? Well, okay. I One of the events that I recall when I think about things like that are our fraternity house would put on uh, dances, uh, one dance a year, you know, just a very a major blowout. Right. And uh, I remember this this one year we decided to advertise it, and we did a couple of things that were really kind of fun. One of them was uh, uh, there was a big craze then for UFOs, flying saucers. So we uh, made some announcements on paper and then cut the paper into circles and so we had a box full of those and at noon uh, on a couple of days my friend and I would uh, get in his airplane and fly over the Purdue campus upside down <laughs> oh, wow <laughs> throw, throwing these <laughs> flying, flying saucers, saucers out. <laughs> oops I see him that was I your flyover <laughs> yeah I see him by the way his name was Chuck May and uh, Chuck had an old PT-19. Some people remember that airplane. But it was an open cockpit, uh, low-wing open cockpit fixed gear. And, and it was originally an, uh, a, 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 sort of an advanced trainer for guys that were learning how to fly. But <laughs> flying upside down over the campus is always kind of a, was a thrill for me. Uh, I, would, <laughs> I would think so for many people, those up above as well as those below. <laughs> Oh. You didn't. We didn't even think about littering at the time. But, no, uh, 
that, that word didn't exist. <laughs> Was, okay. Any, uh, in summary, would you want, looking back, any closing comments you'd like to say for the researchers? Well, guys, pick something that you enjoy. And, and the more you enjoy it, the better you'll do. Okay. It's just, it's been, if you can have a life like mine, I, I would just love to help you do that and, and, and have it, through the years been a mentor to, to young guys. In fact, I'm currently mentoring several right now. Good. Uh, and one of my young men that I'm mentoring is taking over one of the large uh, industries in Taiwan. And um, he's one of the guys directly responsible for OLPC. You don't know what that is? It's called One Laptop Per Child. And it's a small computer that's been designed to go into the third world countries to help young kids. I've heard learn. about that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. And this this young man that I've been mentoring now for 15 years is one of the principal designers of that computer. Hmm. And now his his factory in Taiwan is making these. Oh, okay. And they're turning them out at the rate of about oh, 100,000 a month. Hmm. And what an opportunity for for young kids. Yeah. I've watched the I've taken these computers or um just little kind of small things, but give them to a kid without any instructions, and within 15 minutes, they're online. Can you imagine that? Yes, I can. Ah, gosh, what a, what a thrill. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, what a we, thrill. Yeah, we, you know, we're moving. We're in the process of relocating to our new facility. What's this? Where you, you are? No, no, no. The Archives and Special Collections is oh, moving, you know, moving to the upstairs, aren't right they? to the fourth floor, and it's yeah. really, really going to be nice. There's going to be the dedication. I think will be this spring, but yeah. uh, we're going to relocate up there. We're in the process now of moving There's the materials. Something that's badly needed. Oh, we're just so excited, and and we also have combined um, the things that were in the Cranard School and also Goss mm -hmm. will also sort of oh, all be so, one okay. together. So the Cranard stuff is. Uh, how about the Persian carpets? Are they moving? Uh, through? that I don't. I just know. I don't. That I don't know. But I know that we do have the books, and that they've closed. So we'll, yeah, those, that'll be added in. They had a. Uh, they're one of the few uh, uh, peripheral libraries that had a uh, um, air oh. control. Yes, right. Gordon Law uh, was the librarian yes, at that yes, time, yes, and yes. he was able to get some support for that. Say them. hi to Gordon for me. Oh, is that right? Yeah, good, huh. good guy. Yes, he's In fact, still. Everybody I knew in the library were just super people. All right, but he's he's still at Cornell. He left here and went to Cornell. Mm. Oh, he did. Yeah, oh, okay. that's what he did. Well, thank you very much, Dick. I just enjoyed it, for me. and I really appreciate that. And my best to you and your wife, and for good holidays, and we'll oh. keep in touch. <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome, for the call, sure. Katie. Bye, bye. Okay.